All right, um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. Um, so, so, looking at where we're at, some announcements. Uh, we've got a few people here. Um, so um, I'm planning on going over test one today, see if anybody has any questions over that, review it a bit. I haven't gotten completely through um, all the submissions from the other day. Um, I'm still looking at them. So um, I should get those done here, hopefully before tomorrow sometime, get them back to you. So, but I did go ahead and post an example solution. I'll go through that right now. But yeah, if you're watching this, if you're with me now, or you're watching this later, um, you can pull that down and compare with your own work um, to get my idea of, of kind of what I was looking for on this first test here. So. Um, and then I'll probably take a little break and then we'll look over the materials for this week, the K nearest neighbors and the naive bays. Um, so actually both of these are quite a bit different in, in terms of internally of how they work than logistic regression. So later on, we'll get back to things that are actually uh, working kind of the same way in, in, in the sense that you're defining a, um, you know, a fitness function um, and then you're trying to minimize that function um, in order to you know, fit a set of parameters for the model. So things like a support vector machine and um, uh, neural networks and things like that all kind of work that same way, but uh, Caden Nurse Neighbor is a little bit different. So anyway, um, I'm planning on talking a little bit about that. So. Uh, let me know as usual if you have any questions, any, any things that you guys want to discuss. Um, uh, I mentioned it before I started the recording that um, I am still Zooming this, but probably uh, next week I'm going to have to start doing some things where we do face-to-face -face only just to make certain we don't run afoul of admin. Sorry about that. I did finally get, I think, a solution for the... Um, uh, projector issues I've been having in our classroom, which is the 104 is our official classroom in journalism. I think it's 104, but uh, yeah, the one in the corner there. Uh, but anyway, so that seems to finally be working okay, I think. So. All right, um, let's go ahead and uh, let's go through test one. Um, I've, I've looked through a few of these, um, you know, and I didn't mean it to be too tough. I hope it was a good review. Just doing some linear regressions and some logistic classifications. Probably the toughest was really to do the decision boundary uh, for the logistic classification. So um, um, I think that um, I'm not being too tough on that. So as long as you made a good attempt on that last one um, of doing something, or um, that was probably fine. So. Um, So for the first part, we gave you a function to generate um, a set of data, right? And if you set the random seed to 42, you should have gotten exactly the same values that I showed here. So in particular, but, but this is, you know, just a good example of, of uh, generating random data that can be used to, to test things, you know? So in this case, we know what the, um, uh, values of the parameters are, right? Um, 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 if, if you used it without changing the default, so by default we come in with um, A is negative three, uh, B is one, um, and uh, um, no, C is 3.5, and then B is four, right? So this is a cubic function, so, so we've got, um, um, uh, if you think of this as x to the power of zero, we've actually got four parameters from x to the power of zero up to x to the power of three that fully specifies this. Or, you know, you think of this as the bias or the intercept term, as we've talked about as well. So. Um, So if you use that, I mean, you should have got the same values. Some people asked me about that. They, they seemed like later on um, for generating the, um, the multi-class data, we're getting a different answer, even though I presume that they were setting the seed um, as it was talked about there. So or we're, you know, we're, you know, we're getting some random data, but, but not getting exactly the same value. So I don't, I don't know if um, there was an issue with that or not. So, um, but, but yeah, with this version, if you're using the, um, 
um, the dev box and using the same versions of scikit-learn and NumPy. Um, well, NumPy in this case is the only thing that we really use. So um, you should get the same values if, if you set the seed right before you called the function to generate the, the data. And, and if you use the same amount of data, so. Um, Right. I don't. I don't know. If, I mean, it's a little bit of an aside. I don't know if people know how random um, randomization works. Right. Random number generators. So these are these are uh, examples of pseudo random number generators. So basically, given the seed, it should generate the same sequence of numbers that look pretty much like random numbers. But the thing is, is that the first random number generated, you know, after you set the seed. Um, will always be the same. And then the second one should be the second one in the sequence, so on. So this, a pseudo, pseudo random number generator is really generating um, what's known as a sequence of, of values, right? So the sequence is deterministic, even though the numbers, if you don't know the the, the seed or, or the, the method being used to generate the random sequence, um, the, the numbers should look like random numbers for the most part, right? If it's a good random number generator, but, um, um, but yeah, if you you know if you generate a different number of data, um, um, of course, uh, oh well, I guess you will get the same initial ones, even if you only generate the first fifty of them. So, but yeah, you can see the Y is different now. So. Anyway, um, like I said, that's kind of the size. So, I'm, I mean, I will be looking that, that you gave me a, a basic plot here. Hopefully everybody did a scatter plot. Hopefully everybody took my feedback from um, the uh, uh, past assignments um, and we're using scatter plots instead of um, um, line plots here or something else. So, um, and then, yeah, and then we asked to need a, fit, a linear an actual line, a linear um, um, regression here, right? So this data is obviously not linear. Um, it um, um, so this isn't going to be a good fit, very good fit if you look at the R squared score, right? So for this one, you know, I, I did I left it unspecified. We could have used uh, any of the methods for fitting the line to the data that we've talked about. So. The, the, the simple polyfit method um, from NumPy or using a linear regression object from um, scikit-learn. Um, I had examples of all three of these in the uh, example uh, test solutions here. So, so here's polyfit. Uh, you should get the same slope and intercept on, on all these. Uh, so I came up with a, a intercept of 4.35 and a slope of 1.56 here, uh, and an R squared of 0.65. So. Um, but, but yeah, if you use a linear regression with the default parameters, you should get those same um, slope and intercept for the simple line. So, so linear regression is using is not using any regularization or anything by default in scikit-learn, right? Uh, if you wanted to use the um, stats model like we did for assignment two, uh, of course you would have had it to um, add the dummy um, column to the data, right? So, so uh, add a column of all ones in order to fit and get the same result here. Uh, but if you did that, you should have gotten, again, the, the same slope and intercept. Um, so the, the, the coefficient constant is 4.35 and uh, the, the parameter for X1, which is our slope, um, if we're just fitting the line here, it's the 1.5, if we only have a single um, value like we do here for X. So, it's the same, right? Yeah, 1.5647. Yeah. Um, yeah, and R squared of 0.65 isn't too good here. Um, although, again, you know, it's, it's, you know, if you're looking at, at the R squared values when you're fitting a line like this, it's always contextual, right? So, I mean, 0.65 could be okay in some context. Um, I mean, it could be that you actually have linear data, it's just that it's very noisy, right? Uh, so in that case, you're, you're never gonna get a really good fit. Here we got some noise, but also the, the data is not linear. So both of those are kind of... 
affecting the fit that you would get here. Um, Um, all right. So then I kind of asked you to uh, kind of overfit it. So, so fit a polynomial. We, we know that the cubic has a third degree polynomial, or a third order polynomial. So um, fitting um, a power five polynomial. So to do this, um, Um, you could have used polyfit, but, but, uh, but yeah, I did require for the second part of question one that you did show me using the linear regression and using the polynomial feature. Um, so, um, so, so yeah, I will be looking for you to, to, to show me again you know, using polynomial features to, to generate fifth order, um, you know, so the, the x squared, x cubed, x to fourth, x to fifth power um, features and then fit a linear regression to that, right? Um, um, so here, when you're fitting the, um, you know, using, when you're using polynomial features, um, I mean, there's no randomness involved here. It's just squaring and cubing. Uh, the one feature that we have in the, um, um, the array that we're using as input, right? So, so you should have you should have got exactly the same. But well, uh, again, yeah, if you didn't have quite the same um, random values before, if there's some differences, I guess you wouldn't get exactly the same values again, right? But, but yeah, if you were get using the same seed um, and we're getting the same values for just the single feature x, uh, you should now get the same values for our five um, columns here. Um, so yeah, the first column should be the original uh, x to the power of one column that we had up here. Um, so yeah, the minus, minus, two point, minus 0 0.25, 0 0.90, those were the first three rows here of our um, x value that we had uh, for this randomly generated data here. So, um, but yeah, so you should end up with the first column if you call polynomial fit with that same set of x values, but then this should be the squared. So 0.25 squared should be 0 0.06, right? And this should be the cube and the fourth power and the fifth power. Right? And they should get smaller and smaller because whenever you, you go to a higher power, of course, um, if, if the value, all the values are less than one, if you made one and one, so if you square a cube them, they're going to get smaller. So you should see all these getting kind of smaller and smaller. So, the only one that's still significant was the one, the biggest one, the 0.9 is still 0.6 when you take it to the fifth power here. And I guess the other thing is, is right, only the um, the cube and the fifth power columns uh, and, and the, the original column should have negative values. Um, And then um, I did ask you to do a linear regression with no regularization. So basically just a default um, linear regression. But in this case, of course, we're performing the regression on the, um, the data with the, uh, the added uh, fifth order uh, features here. So we're really fitting, uh, we're using least squares, but to fit a polynomial function, right? So um, that's a perfectly kind of, a little tricky, but but a perfectly valid kind of thing to do. So the result though should be a a, a line that wiggles, and that in this case, um, since the original was a, a cubic, you know, third order, um, um, we're, we're potentially overfitting, but we don't do too bad here. In, in fact, um, and, and and I am going to be looking. I am looking that that people visualize this again. Um, so you know that you created a scatter plot. Um, and then you predict to show the fitted quadratic polynomial. Um, and um, and yeah, I, I mean, I did also ask you to, to plot the true function as well. So um, so hopefully everybody got all three of those components. This is an example of doing that, right? So here, you know, the, the, the dash red line um, is the actual true, um, you know, the ground truth um, for this random data that we're 
kind of fit here. Um, but you could have got a pretty good uh, fit. Um, and, um, and, and yeah, you know, right. So you should have got a much better R squared score in this case. Uh, uh, and again, you should have been exactly the same numbers. Um, it, 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 it's, I had to check this. Some people said that, that um, they were getting um, uh, not exactly the same numbers, even though uh, they were using the seed as asked for. So if, if you, you know, if, if you did something like, like add an extra line of code in here or something, I mean, you know, you can get the, the random number generator uh, off in the sequence, so you won't get exactly the same. It's probably not a big deal if you weren't getting exactly, the uh, vision got something close, even if you weren't getting exactly the same random numbers here. Um, and then, yeah, you can compare the coefficients, right? So these are the um, 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 what way would this go here? So these would be so in this case, you know. Um, um, We're going to have our intercept term, and then we're going to have um, all five terms here, right? Um, so this is going to correspond to. I should probably, probably, I should probably try and remember what the um, um, what the coefficients are. But then, I mean, in this case, you will get values for all those, including the the power of the, the, the you know the, the the one for the power of the four and one to the one for the power of the fifth term, right? Um, and, but yeah, presumably those will be modeling the noise a little bit. It's going to be really only have a, a cubic function here. Um, Oh, I, yeah, I even gave you, this is one, one of the figures that I gave you as an example to try and model. So hopefully everybody got something close to that on the um, second part there of the first question. Um, um, and then the, the third part of that first question is a little bit more open-ended, you know, just do something, show up, demonstrate, doing some regularization. So in this case, um, it would make more sense since you know what's going on to um, um, to use some of the L1 norm, um, the, the one that, that drives the parameters to, um, uh, you know, it's more likely to try to drive them to zero, right? So we talked a little bit about that, the L2 versus the L1, the, the last one under a grid, ridge. So. Um, so I guess what, um, I didn't show too many examples there, just showed actually just using elastic net, so you could use, give uh, both ridge to, to both um, L1 and L2 at the same time. Um, um, that, that was what elastic net was. It was, it was the one that combined both of those, if, if you remember. Um, so here, um, although, right, I do wonder if we could have made a better example here because it did drive one of the parameters completely to zero, but the other one is still pretty significant. Um, and it didn't really help the R squared score much. So, um, as you know, we were getting 0.9365 um, before with no regularization. In fact, it went down a little bit. Um, but yeah, in this case, you know, I was using Mostly, remember the L1 ratio is uh, for the elastic net, if you don't recall. Um, is um, um, the, the, the amount of the balance between, you know, the L1 and the L2 regularization, right? So, um, 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 since it's called the L1 ratio, bigger numbers mean that you're doing more of the L1, which is the uh, type of regularization that tends to drive the, the parameter down to zero. Um, L1 norms here. So, um, so in particular, if we wanted to just completely do uh, L1, 
make that ratio 1.0. Um, and uh, yeah, it still didn't uh, completely get rid of that. Or we could use um, um, just use a ridge regression. That I've, we've imported, I can't remember if we imported all those for you guys or not. Um, Um, oh, yeah, so for your heater, right, since I'm changing it, um, let's try a big alpha, just as an example, Maybe even bigger. So anyway, yeah, because I was expecting that to go. Um, do I have that backwards? So I really mean lasso. I guess I wanted. Yeah, I did want. Oh, I did want the other one. I sometimes forget which one is which without reading the. If I can get one, I'm, I'm basically trying to just give an example of just driving the the fourth and fifth powers closer to zero, right? So. There we go. <laughs> That's what I wanted. Um, I really wanted the L1 regularization there. So maybe a little bit too much. You know, we've only got the uh, X1 and X squared. Um, oh, and the R squared, R squared score. So another thing to look at this if you're you know, playing around with this, uh, how it's affecting your R squared fit, right? Um, so it went back to pretty much like when we were trying to fit a, a straight line to the model there, 0.64. So, so that, that's not very good regularization there. So. Anyway, um, like I said, it's a little bit open-ended, so I'm just looking for you to demonstrate one of those here. Um, um, so you, you'll get results. Of, so, my memory it's it's not too easy to get um, a better r squared score than what you get with no regularization um, there's not any any really good kind of settings or parameters to, to improve that much um, in this case um all right So uh, yeah, that was the first part. Anybody want to ask, ask me questions about the, the question one part? All right. Um, so yeah, like I said, I, I mean, you know, hope hope most people didn't find that too difficult. I, I didn't mean it to be really difficult. Just mostly a review of some of the the most basic things that we've talked about. So in particular, you know, that you know what we mean by fitting a linear regression. Um, are able to demonstrate using some of the 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 basic models from Scikit Learn, like like the linear regression. Um, kind of know what regularization means at this point. Um, and, and, and what it's used for. So, um, that was the first question. Oh, and you know, some plotting and and you know, the revisiting uh, NumPy, using NumPy a little bit, things like that. Um, all right. So the second part was then to do a classification um, again, though with our official data set. So um, it turns out Scikit Learn has functions for generating data like this, kind of like what we did by hand on the first part on the previous assignment. Um, so there's a make blobs function, right? 
So, so part of this was to kind of learn how to use the make blobs. Um, it's a good skill to learn. I mean, you know, in general, you know, to, to be able to, um, nope, that one's not working, huh? Um, to be able to um, use the documentation for a library like scikit-learn, right? Um, um, to be able to understand it and um, 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 you know, do things with it. So you know, bring the contextual help back up again to make blobs, right? So, you know, but really understanding some of the basics of, of, of these things, you know? So, so for example, like, like understanding what L1 or L2 regularization or stuff like that really is, is really kind of background knowledge that you need before you can use well things like the lasso or the ridge or things like that, right? So, so same same thing kind of here, right? So, so um, reading the documentation isn't always enough. There's certain kinds of concepts that you have to know uh, to be able to use it well, right? And the more the more you do this stuff, you know, so the more you do machine learning make models, um, do data analytics, uh, um, the broader base that you'll build and, 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 and documentation will be more and more helpful um, to use to do things with. So, um, but yeah, in this case, I mean, it's really just returning um, an artificial data set um, with, um, um, some um, some clustering in it, right? Um, and and um, right, we can specify the number of features. So I ask you to, to, to generate with four features so as to, to figure that stuff out. Um, again, you would have had to, um, uh, or actually, the number of um, centers. Um, Uh, yeah, so, so so we have just two features, feature one and feature two. So, so we're using the, the inputs, the X values, uh, there's just two of them in this case. Um, and the number of centers controls the, the actual the number of classes that you have, right? So, so this is supposed to be an example of a multi-class problem. Um, Um, I gave you some of these these values, so like um, using a um, clustered standard deviation of three. Um, and, and again, if you started the random state, so you could have either used the random state um, value um, in make blobs, or uh, I think it works both ways, or it should. And so I'm not completely certain why some people had, uh, maybe weren't seeing exactly the same numbers that might have been generated there, unless, um, Unless maybe you're using a different version of NumPy, um, or you know, so have different versions of libraries. So that when you change versions of libraries, um, I mean, that can have an effect on um, uh, on where the sequence will start for the pseudo random number generators down in your libraries. Doesn't always, but but yeah, sometimes if you're on different versions of things, uh, you might not get exactly the, the same sequence starting at the same seed. So. Uh, but uh, but uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, I did just check this again, and I was getting, um, I think, still the sequence with these versions of NumPy that I had shown um, as what you ought to expect. So, uh, like, these are the first five rows uh, of our two feature column uh, data, right? Um, negative five point three nine by five point two one for the first value, right? So each one of these rows uh, ends up being one point um, on the scatter plot, if you did the scatter plot correctly here, right? Um, and if you did the centers using um, setting the parameter for, for four centers with the cluster standard deviation of three, you should have gotten, eh, you know, so, so the centers represent our four classes in this problem. Uh, but there's quite a bit of overlap on these with our two features here. So, you know, our, uh, if, if we fit a um, logistic regression um, to this, um, it won't, you know, be able to do perfect, of course, and, and, and it might have uh, quite a bit of difficulty, right? In particular, there seems to be quite a bit of overlap 
on the class zero, the zero cluster um, between um, three and, and uh, the other one here. You know, just by randomness, by for this random seed, you know, the, the class two was a little bit better separated um, compared to these other three. Um, all right, so yeah, I mean, you know, I, I am going to, I am expecting you to visualize this somehow, right? There's lots of ways you could have um, visualized this. Um, so, I guess in the function that I gave in the um, example code here, uh, we're just using straightforward matplotlib. Um, but um, 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 we're writing a loop to basically, so in this example, we're writing a loop to pull out the um, four different classes. All right, so this goes over the, um, Maybe I should explain this a little bit. I mean, you didn't have to get this fancy. So, I mean, you could have just hard coded in four calls to plot, right? But, but we're basically doing the same thing, just parameterizing things a little bit here. Um, so, you know, if, if you don't know what zip is, basically what it does is um, our, our labels, markers, and colors um, all have um, our arrays that have the same number of values in them, right? Um, So I guess we're only using the first four in this example, so not to confuse too much. So since there's only, um, probably since there's only four labels in here, this loop only runs four times. So we only end up using the first four markers. So the, the, you know, so these are symbols for circle, triangle, square, and diamond, right? And we just end up using the first four colors from the color set array that we um, pass in here, right? So zip basically, ends up taking, for example, the, the zeroth value of each one of these, and, and that becomes a tuple of the three values. So, so the first time through the loop, you know, the, the label will be whatever the first value was in the markers, uh, color will be whatever the first value in colors was, and, um, um, and marker will be whatever the first value in marker was, right? Um, In this case, um, we're demonstrating using a little bit of um, NumPy, right? So inside of the loop, we only pull out the X and Y values that have that particular label, that are in the particular class, right? So, so each time of the loop, first time of the loop, we're only pulling out the ones that are labeled zero um, because of this, um, uh, you know, this, this um, um, we're indexing our array here using a Boolean index. So every place where Y is equal to the label, which is zero the first time through the loop, and we'll pull out those Xs um, and those Ys, right? And, and we just only plot those, right? In this case though, right, uh, X has two features. So we plot column zero and column one. You know, so that's gonna be our feature one and feature two here. Um, um, and then we use all the other information to specify which marker we want, um, which um, color we want for the marker, um, and for the... But yeah, you didn't have to be that fancy. So, you know, at, at a minimum, if you'd done something like, um, if we have our um, X and Y here, you know, you could have, um, run these by hand. So, for example, say um, um, 
So it'd probably be, probably be best to, to try and um, uh, break this up into uh, multiple lines here, but um, let me see if I can do it. Um, um, so we want to pull out the, the rows where y is zero, um, uh, using Boolean indexing, but um, only column zero. Um, so that's our, our, our one of the two features here. And then the other column is the other feature. And then, you know, we can work up the like, um, had a uh, red circle. It's a red circle. All right. At the most basic here. Um, right, so that should have just been the class zeros. Right, and they're just yeah. So the other ones for our other classes, um, although you know it would have been good if if you um, probably be looking though that you also added in. Yeah, you know, like a legend labeled the the um, the um, figure that kind of thing. So here, I'm just um, instead of doing the loop, I'm just kind of hard coding these in. So we plot the zeroth feature, the first feature, the second feature, um, and the third feature using some uh, NumPy. Um, Boolean indexing to get only those features out of X, and um, and then then yeah, I would have wanted to change the marker types for all these. So like um, uh, setting blue triangle, uh, triangle, triangle, um, green square, and whatever that is, purple. Say cyan and diamond. Something like that. Right. So that should have gotten me the basics of the green information. Then add in some, uh, add in some, you know, the legend and um, label your axes, and then you've been good there. So. Um, but like I said, I mean, there's lots of ways um, um, you could have done this. Um, um, so there's an example using um, Seaborn. So for Seaborn, you give it you give it things that are like data frames. Um, so so, but it makes it simple. So I, you can say things like, um, uh, I, although I had to put it into a data frame first because because we only had it as a regular NumPy array. So if you do that, you know, you can say plot the x1 and x2 on the x and y axes and use um, the, the third column y uh, for color. So, so color that hue means um, uh, color the markers by that. I think there's a way for Seaborn, you know, to say give the marker shape. Um, so um, let's open up the um, contextual help again here. So like... Um, Style maybe, or markers, prime markers, I guess. Um, so again, I could say also, you know, get, change the marker shape by the label Y, zero, one, two, three. Um, so that works. Oh, oh, didn't work. Um, Yeah, it's not markers. It uh, must be one of the other parameters. Style, maybe. There we go. So, so that changed the markers there. A little small, so probably have a size. Let's make it bigger here. 
even bigger. Anyway, so um, we have my exactly size sizes. Anyway, I'll stop playing around, but that, that's the kind of thing you have to do to, um, you know, to um, use the documentation to, to figure out in order to do what you want to do for, you know, whatever plot like this, or uh, using um, a scikit-learn model to fit some data or whatever, right? Um, Okay. Oh, and um, I did also ask you to demonstrate, you know, doing some test train split here. So I didn't didn't um, I didn't have you do anything like cross validation or anything like that. But uh, but a basic test train split here at the um, um, uh, before fitting the model um, for the second question, right? So um, I think I asked you to to use scikit learns. So I will be looking at you. Uh, imported and use the um, uh, frame cat split like we demonstrated a couple of times here um, with a 725 split. Right. So yeah, if you did that, you should have had 375 points from the made up blobs data set um, for the training set and, and, and then the, the rest of 125, the other 25% um, in the uh, test set. Um, yeah, um, and then um, to finish up here, I mean, you should have fit a logistic regression. So logistic regression is basically for, uh, it's really for the, the basic um, machine learning one that we've talked about so far for doing classification tasks, right? So a bit misnamed, but um, um, that's the one to, reach for here. Um, I didn't tell you um, um, any parameter to use here. So we just did the default. Should have worked fine. Um, and you would have gotten something like, uh, I still got the same score there. So let me rerun all this just to make certain that Yeah, so I was getting a score of about 90% um, accuracy on the training data uh, that you, the same data that you train it with. Um, um, oh, did I? Oh, uh, yeah, so I fit it on the whole thing. So that might have been a mistake there. So I've, I've, um, um, so I gotta go back and fix this from my published solution here. So you really should have been uh, fitting this just on the, the train data. Something like that, right? Um, but then, you know, right, you can ask, you know, still got 0.91 um, just on the train, uh, but then you can ask if you only fit it on the train, you know, how, how does the performance look? Uh, on data that uh, you didn't, that has never seen before. So just on, on the data that we split out for the test data here, right? So, um, hmm, I don't know if there's something not quite right with that or not, because I keep getting the same things there, even though, I'll rerun everything again.
Yeah. So anyway, um, I'm, I tend to be getting a bit above nine um, on this example solution. Um, um, when you evaluate the stuff on, on the data that you trained it with, and it goes down not too much, a little bit, uh, maybe, um, when you look at, at uh, test data that you haven't seen before, right? Probably, you know, in this case, you know, the, the um, um, it's not, it's probably not overfitting too much. So it's probably not too much of a surprise that we're getting still pretty similar. It's not the, about the same performance um, on our test data um, uh, here. Let's see. Um, so, I mean, if, if you played around with the parameters, you could probably um, improve that fit a little bit. Um, so, I guess I deleted that. So, like, uh, for example, the important parameter was did we talk about the um, the C parameters? So that, that's the one that. Um, um, Uh, by, by default, the logistic regression option um, um, model actually is doing some regularization. Um, so, um, and that's controlled by C, although it's kind of the inverse of the, um, the alpha parameter that we talked about for the, you know, that the, 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 um, modifies the amount of regularization that we uh, put in um, in the, the previous models that we talked about here. So anyway, so, so C is a, is a kind of regularization, right? So um, if you played around with that, you might have been able to improve the performance a little bit. I didn't really ask you to do that. So well, again, I, I keep getting, it's like exactly the same results. I'm not certain. Check, see if everything's running correctly. Huh. Yeah, really affected a little bit. Anyway, um, yeah, stop. So, but yeah, you know, I'm just looking for a basic uh, fit of a logistic regression here. Um, probably you should be getting been getting something around 90% on your accuracy on the score. So score is really giving you the accuracy um, in this case um, on the uh, classification results. So. Um, and um, um, here's an example. Uh, I asked for the confusion matrix on the, uh, again, you know, on the training data and also on the test data, right? Um, a basic example is using confusion matrix from um, um, scikit-learn. So um, if, if, if you give the labels and then you give the predictions, it's also over both of these though, um, if you're using confusion matrix from scikit-learn, uh, you know, um, if you're getting that from the scikit-learn metrics here, um, basically. Although there's one one thing here, I don't remember if I mentioned this for um, um, when I talked about these or not. So the order actually does matter here. So so again, here is where you know, kind of looking at or paying attention to the documentation um, is um, useful because you're supposed to give the true values first. You know, if we look at the uh, the documentation, and then the prediction sh should go second, right? Uh, and, and the order does matter. So if you switch those around, um, um, it can have an effect. You can get a different confusion matrix. Um, um, likewise, you can get a different uh, score. So um, Um, but uh, yeah, for sure though, I mean, you always had to give the inputs first and uh, so you probably couldn't really mess that one up as easily. So. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so. If we gave the predictions first and the labels, the, the, the true value second, um, it might affect your results that you see. Yeah, it does, so you see that it changed a little bit. So.
Um, all right, of course you could have done fancier. So there, we had examples of using um, the, the plotting one from, I can't remember where, but then we could have used those as well to display the confusion matrix. Um, I think from Matplotlib has something to plot confusion matrices. Um, um, all right, then to kind of wrap up, like I said, I'm probably not really, going to be that picky on this last one. Um, I, I, although I did give an example of, of what would be a, a good visualization, you might have been able to get a similar, the same thing by just copying um, the example from a lecture notebook and modifying it appropriately for the data here. So again, um, um, in this example here, uh, we are using um, contour again. So, so we, 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 I didn't really talk about that very much, but then uh, we did use uh, contour plots in order to show decision boundaries. So, so, so basically, um, I mean, that's not, not usually their main purpose, what you use contour plots for, but they can work for decision boundaries like this because you can think of the contour as um, um, you know, so, so the, the if you plot um, where the predictions, you know, the, the predicted values, you'll get contours, and and then if you identify uh, the contour, you know, that's the difference between um, um, whether you're going to classify the class zero, or class one, you can get a, the hard decision boundary, which is which is what we're doing um, in this example solution here. So. Um, just to discuss it a little bit. Um, the important things are this mesh grid. So basically we call predict uh, and we pass in um, uh, the X and the Y, but this basically just created a grid over, uh, you know, like, like the, the X minimum to the X maximum, um, which we got programmatically, but basically from like negative 15 to 15 and, you know, negative 15 to 20 or something like that, right? So, um, but this is creating like a, a grid of points, um, kind of like, like the, the uh, uh, wind space, right? So, so a grid of evenly spaced points, but in this case, on two dimensions. And then when we call predict on that though, it's gonna give us predictions for all these points on our two dimensional grid here. So we can use that prediction then um, to um, um uh, to plot these as contours, okay? So, so basically the, the prediction for the train logistic regression model is gonna give you a value zero, one, two, or three, right? The classes are one, two, or three. So then if you if you plot those, so for the result, if you looked at the Z here, which we could do a little bit. Um, is, is we're just gonna have a two-dimensional matrix. Um, uh, we're gonna have to do it inside of here, I guess. So, um, Get the first five rows of Z here. So, um, um, oh yeah, it ends up being ends up being flat. So yeah, that's why we reshaped it here um, in, into the same shape here. So yeah, the first five values were all twos, but but yeah, after we I should have done this after I reshaped it. So. Um, So yeah, this mesh grid ends up being, you know, um, 1,707 rows by 1,445 columns. And for every one of those points, we call the predict function. 
um, and we get the, the logistic regression prediction, zero, one, two, or three, right? Is kind of what we're showing here, right? So you can see that, that on, on the first row, it, it's twos over here. Uh, this is probably gonna be flipped. So the, the first row is probably down here on, on the grid. So, so we're getting all twos, uh, but then one's kind of out here, right? And when, when you plot that as a contour, um, you know, it, it, it uses the color map to pick colors for these four classes. And, um, and then you can visualize the decision boundaries in that way. So, um, all right, um, let's see, does anybody have anything they want to discuss? about any of those questions? So that's up there, um, if anybody wants to look at it. But I, I, I've only looked at a few so far. Um, so anyway. All right, uh, let's, uh, I'm gonna take just a, a quick, like five minute break here. So it's like about 525, 526. So we'll come back at 530 then. We just need to go down to the restroom. Uh, I'll talk a little, I don't know if it'll be too much longer, but uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the KNN and um, uh, Naive Bays and see if anybody wants to ask questions about those things. All right, so we'll be right back then. All right, uh, I'll start back up. Um, so, like I said, I don't know if it'll be too much longer here. Um, so for this week, um, the, the notebooks are down here in the archive. If everybody saw those, uh, I thought I'd go over those real quickly here. Um, just a note, I think. Um, um, so next week, Next unit, we're going to be going through the support vector machines. And then after that, I uh, might not have notebooks created yet for these things. Um, so um, uh, if we get to that point, um, and I haven't posted anything yet, uh, there are some notebooks from the Dr. Ng's lectures. So we're going to be also talking about like decision trees um, and ensembles um, and then some other stuff. So. Uh, I'll see if I get a chance to, to maybe create some, some new notebooks specifically and maybe cut a video or something, although it might be uh, just recording the, the class session and, and trying to post that as kind of a lecture video, uh, maybe using uh, um, uh, some of these right now. But um, but anyway, yeah, so, so we're coming up on that, uh, although we are still going to be doing readings from the hands-on machine learning textbook, which has sections on, you know, um, support vector machines and ensemble learning and trees and things like that. So, um, all right. But anyway, I'm just saying, um, and you know, sorry for scanning these around. I haven't, haven't organized these uh, yet uh, just because I don't have a uh, complete set of lectures and some other stuff, some of these from the, from the hands-on machine learning textbook. Um, but anyway, this, this is the one, these are the two that were for, supposed to be for this week. Uh, they're down in the archive area here, um, if it wasn't clear. So, um, So K nearest neighbors is um, really good. I mean, you can use K nearest neighbors both for regression and classification tasks. So you can use it for, for both of the things that we've talked about so far. Uh, it kind of makes more sense um, as a using it for classification, which is what I think we mostly use it for conceptually. But, but you can use it for regression um, as well. Um, it's really, it, 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 it's, it's a lot simpler than, um, um, than, than the, the fitting that we've been talking about so far for uh, linear regression, okay? In fact, it's so simple that I don't know if we did it here, but it's, it's often, um, it's, it's pretty easy to actually write your own implementation 
of K nearest neighbors. Um, and I encourage you to maybe try that out um, if, if you didn't do it in here. So, um, so anyway, how it works, um, as the name implies, what you do is, so let's think of a classification task. In this case, we've got two classes. We've got the reds and the blues here. So again, think of that as a binary classification, uh, or zeros and ones. Um, so for, for k nearest neighbors to work, you have to have, be able to have some measure of distance, right, or similarity. So you can kind of think of them both as, as the same here in this context. So for a lot of the, the um, machine learning algorithms that we're going to be looking at um, that don't work exactly like linear regression, they, they, they work kind of like k nearest neighbors. So also when we talk about decision trees, We've got some idea of similarity, um, which we need to use in order to um, do the algorithm. Okay, so for k nearest neighbors, um, 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 the easiest thing is to like say say the distance in some space is a measure of similarity. Okay, so in that case, I mean intuitively, right? If I have a new point x that I want to classify, which is what I think we were doing in the notebook here. Um, but it's most sim similar to the points that are closest to it, okay? So for example, if we wanna, if we, so normally what you do for K nearest neighbors, the K means the, how many of the nearest neighbors you wanna consider. So if K was three, the three nearest neighbors would be the ones that are identified in the circle here, right? So for a classification task, what you do is you just, you just uh, do it like, a, think of it as like a vote, right? So whichever class has the most uh, uh, wins, right? So in this case, we have two of reds and, and one of blue. So we would, uh, by Katie nearest neighbors, we would classify point X um, as the red class. Now, usually we do something slightly more um, complex than that. So, so when we're doing a classification task for Katie nearest neighbors, we might also weight these by the distance, right? So, so you can easily, for example, multiply um, um, or do like a weighted sum. So um, take the value and weight by the distance. So things that are closer, you would have to do the weighting kind of reverse. Right? So it's gonna have a smaller distance, but you wanna give them um, a, a bigger influence on the, um, uh, the final vote, you know, the, the, the final class that you're going to determine for the point that we're picking here, right? Um, I think we talk more about that later, but but yeah, so it's a, at this point, though, you can just think of, um, think of taking a, a vote. So the majority is the winner, um, which is pretty simple. Although, of course, then I guess the reason why I started bringing up the idea of doing some sort of a weighted vote is you always have the problem, right? Like if you want to use an even number of, of K, like two, so the two closest neighbors are going to be one red and one blue. So you can't, you get a tie in that case. You have to have something some way great. You're just using a majority vote, right? Um, and, and yeah, in practice, you know, we, we're usually using some sort of a weighted um, Weighting uh, function here, so um, so you often you, so you don't have a strict vote, so that kinds of ties, even if you're using even values of k, isn't in practice a big deal. So, um, so k and n is, is extremely simple. Uh, you know, I encourage you to try your hand at implementing it, right? So for example, to, to do this measure of similarity, so to do exactly the algorithm that I just did, you know, you know let's forget it again about the complexities of, of um, weighting the votes and things like that. So all you have to do is, okay, I have the, the point. So in this case, we've got like two features in our space here. So the, this point that we're trying to classify, let's say it's at, at uh, 45, 55, whatever it is, right? So all you have to do to do, to do K nearest neighbors is um, calculate the distance between this point and every other point where the, you, you, know, you can use just the Euclidean distance. So you know, the, the, uh, the difference in X 
squared plus the difference in y squared and the square root of that gives you the Euclidean puzzle. Um, so then for that, you would have a distance between this point and every other point. And then Python is pretty easy. You can sort all those by the distance from the smallest to the largest. And if you need k near, if you need k of three, uh, you just take the three nearest after you've sorted it, right? So those would be the three points that were nearest. Then you would look at the, the class of those three points and, and count them up to get your vote if you're just doing a majority vote, right? And that's really all that, um, that's the basics of k and n with um, some other things that we can add in, right? Um, so yeah, there's only, the, the, so some properties of KNN, um, it really requires no training um, because for example, every time I wanna classify a new point that's not in my data set that I use as my model, I'm gonna to have to recalculate the distance between that new point and every other point. So you can't really train anything ahead of time. You just got the data uh, in the data set that I'm gonna use a, a KNN classifier. Um, have to do so, so I mean every time I have to calculate the distance find the and then the other parameter is k you know so whatever k is the, the if k is three uh, I have to calculate all the distances so I can figure out which are the three nearest neighbors and then use those three nearest neighbors to figure out either by majority vote or some sort of weighted voting um, what the uh, what my the prediction is going to be for the class right uh, oh, and by the way, before I forget, so, you know, you can do pretty much the a same thing if you want to do a regression problem. So for a regression problem, um, um, each one of these points, instead of having a class, zero or one, is going to have the output value. Let's say that the price in the house, um, if there's two or three nearest neighbors. But I think for regression, it's even easier. Uh, so normally what you do is you just average. Again, you can take the weighted average or just a straightforward average of your k points, the k nearest neighbors. Right, you know, of whatever the, the target output is that you're trying to predict for the regression. Um, right, so you know, so it has these interesting properties, which is quite different from the linear regression and the logistic regression we've talked about so far. It doesn't really require any training. Um, Um, so that means that, you know, we can easily add new data. You know, so we don't have to retrain a new model every time we want to add new data into it. We just have those into the data set that we're using for our KNN classifier or KNN regressor. Um, it does, it, 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 KNN um, is not considered a top performing machine learning algorithm, okay? So, so it's one of the weaker ones. Um, so, I mean, it, it works fine for smallish problems and things, um, but um, when, when you get to large data sets or high dimension data sets, so data sets with large number of features, um, uh, it, it easily starts being outperformed by um, uh, logistic regression or support vector machines or some, some other, um, um, and so, so it tends to be one of the, the lower performers, one of the worst performers. But you know, it's so easy; it's often used as a as a like a baseline or as a first approximation. Okay, so however well K and N does, you hope that you can do something better. So you might do a K and N first to see what the as a kind of baseline performance, um, and then try to improve on that. Right. So. Um, It doesn't scale very well, um, so you know. So it doesn't require any new training or retraining to fit a model if you want to add new data to it. But every time you want to make a prediction, you have to recalculate the, the distance and similarity between the new point you're trying to predict and every other point that you have in the data set. Um, so, so it has a to compare. You compare that to like the logistic regression. So once you fit a logistic regression model. You've got a set of, you know, however many parameters that you had. Um, and to, to calculate the prediction is you're just going to be doing a, um, the, the, the weighted sum between those parameters and the input value. So that, that is usually a lot less work than if I'm trying to predict the distances between 
what came in, if I've got millions or billions of, of points in the data set that I want to do the KNN on. So, you know, so it's a lot more work to fit a model like logistic regression, but once you have those parameters set, um, it's, it's fast. It's very, it's, it's almost instantaneous to make predictions um, on data. And it's kind of the reverse for KNN. Um, All right. So um, again, you know, I'd, I would encourage you to look up uh, an implementation in Python of KNN or, or try it yourself. It's, 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 you know, you can do it in like five or ten lines of code. Um, but um, um, here, the, we'll show it. You know, just using Scikit-Learn. So of course, Scikit-Learn um, has um, KNN. Um, objects um, and then you know the 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 the, the KNN and scikit learn. Um, I'll come back to this, but um, um, so for like for example the the, the K neighbors classifier, you specify um, uh, the number of neighbors or the K uh, and other parameters, right? But but um, um, what I was starting to say is, I mean it. it the, the, the K neighbors classifier fits into the, um, uh, the, the fit transformer uh, framework like the other models that we look at. So, so using it is the same as using the logistic um, classifier or, or linear regression model or the other models that we look at, right? So, so uh, you first fit the data, but again here, I mean, really fit is just not doing anything. So um, it, uh, it is doing something. It remembers the, 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 the inputs and the labels, but that's all it does. It just saves those so that whenever you ask it to do a predict, um, it can perform the, um, the K near, nearest neighbors calculation that I just talked about, right? So calculate all the distances, find the, the K nearest or the number, the, the, the nearest neighbors, um, and um, combine those in some way. So, um, the, the default, if we read the documentation, um, is um, it, it uses some sort of a uniform weighting. Um, when it's combining, you know, so, so the default is to use five, K of five, so the number of neighbors of five. Um, and it uses uniform weighting versus like a, some sort of a, a distance or scale weighting, right? Um, so yeah, in this case, uniform weighting is kind of like majority voting, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't take into account things that are closer or further away in the distance. Uh, um, it's just going to be combined. So if you're doing a regression, it would take a simple average of the uniform weight. But if you use scale weighting, um, it's going to multiply the um, basically, you know, scaling as we use the distance. And the further away, um, um, the less weight. So we're going to be inverse on the distance by um, um, how you scale that. So, um, anyway, um, let's maybe we'll come back to some of that. But um, Um, okay, so uh, in the, the lecture notebook and in my lecture video for this week, uh, we showed an example of doing it on the IRS data set that we've seen before. So remember, this is a, a multi-class data set. So um, again, I mean, and, and, and you can use KNN on multi-class data sets just fine as well. So again, if you think of it as majority voting, in that case, you can have, you know, how, how, how many of the nearest neighbors for class zero, how many were class one, how many were class two. Um, and then again, if one of those is the clear winner by a simple majority vote, that would be your predicted class if you're doing classification. Um, but yeah, it's, it's more typical to, to do some sort of weighting. Um, well, I guess the default is uniform um, weighting for the uh, 
pay neighbors classifier and so I can learn. Uh, um, We've talked about scaling before here, so, so I kind of reminded you of this because um, I think it's the case. So some, some of the machine learning algorithms that we talked about in this class are very sensitive to features that are of different scales. Um, and a, in Kenya's neighbors, um, is one of those, I don't remember if, if I'm saying if I'm something incorrect or not. So, I mean, in general, um, um, it's, it's, it's always a good idea to um, ask if you should be scaling the data or not, right? Um, and, and also to know uh, which classifiers are sensitive to the data that's, that's on different scales and, and won't work as well if you don't scale it ahead of time. So, um, so I, see, I didn't discuss it explicitly, but uh, but yeah, KNN is um, KNN is going to be sensitive to scaling because, like, if one of your feature dimensions just goes from like zero to one, whereas the other one goes from zero to 100, for example. The problem with that is that uh, the, the, the distance on the, the, the zero to one dimension that I talked about is, is gonna be small uh, in that direction for all the points. Um, and, and it can be potentially much larger on the other dimension, right? So because of that, if you don't scale ahead of time, so you have similar um, uh, ranges, for the two features, um, the distance of a point um, um, that e even even if it's like a full one unit away, that distance is only one um, in, in that direction. If, if the scale was zero to one, whereas on the other direction, I can be just a little bit away, but but I would be like say five units away, and that, that's that's a much larger distance than that. So I believe that, that yeah, it's, you do have to be careful about um, um, scale for taking in. Um, um, it's better to um, um, scale your data first, which is probably why why we were scaling it here in this example. Um, I'm sure our, our, our um, hands-on machine learning textbook uh, um, talked about this as well. So these examples are coming from the, the uh, chapter four from our hands on machine learning. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like I said, um, once you create a scikit-learn K number classifier, you use it the same way that you should be familiar with by now. So, um, so you know, if we've scaled the data, we can we can uh, uh, train it on scaled data, right? Um, in this case, so, so again, we were using the um, the iris data set here. Right, so you can see that it, it, it does pretty well. So um, um, looking at the confusion matrix, I got one wrong um, here on our uh, test data. So here, I mean, we were using a multi-class um, Classification here. We had three classes: the um, the progenica, Satosa, and whatever the third one was. Versus color. Um, so 
Oh, yeah. So um, the, the one thing, if you want to use a K and N seriously, is, is, you know, so the parameter K, the number of neighbors that you consider, that's that's the one thing that you can really, um, um, that, that's the only parameter that you can really kind of um, talk and try different values on to see how it affects the performance, right? So, um, and, and, you know, for, I mean, different data sets, the, the, the best K you use is, is, is going to, is going to be different. Right? So sometimes a smaller one works better for some basis, and sometimes a larger number of neighbors works better. Right? So um, there's actually built-in things for um, uh, doing some of this automatically for, for testing different values of K to see uh, which works the, the best here. Um, so I think in, in this notebook, uh, again, probably coming directly from our um, textbook, hands-on machine textbook, we showed it kind of doing it by hand, right? So, so we build um, a, a K neighbors classifier using K from one to 40. Um, and we do our predictions um, and then we, 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 we calculate an overall error rate, right? So if you do that, you can kind of see that um, uh, here the, the error rates Smaller are going to be better, right? So th there's really not much to say except uh, at some point uh, a larger. So so even down to just one nearest neighbor, maybe not the best. So we can get all the way down to zero on our test data um, from like six up to thirty or so, right? But probably at some point, the too many neighbors um, um, definitely then is too much. You know? So once we get above that. Um, it's no longer going to be able to do its best. Right? That, that's all that's being illustrated. Um, example here. So I said five to eighteen. I probably would have said five to thirty or so, but yeah. Um, Yeah, and, and uh, actually, I guess I didn't have it in this notebook. I think that there's a way um, to actually kind of do that same thing, but have it done automatically for you. I mean, you could you could set up a grid search um, um, and, and do that, like we've shown briefly um, once or twice before. Um, there are some other parameters. Um, So um, yeah, I'm not seeing it. I can't remember. Um, I thought I thought there was something in there you could ask it to give you an estimate of what a good K is for a data set. I have to look that up. Um, all right. Um, questions about that? That was you know. So so that notebook is relatively short, quick. Um, If um, no questions, let's, let's go. I don't have a lot to say about Bay, about Bayes either. It, it is a little bit um, more complicated. So, so, so the naive Bayes classifier um, is based on um, on on on, on Bayes um, algorithm Bayes equation um, for um, conditional probabilities. Um, which I don't know if I want to really try and get into right here, and, and is not completely important because you know again, the more you understand about the details of this, the, the better you'll be able to use it. But um, 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 at the same time, you know, kind of in this class, uh, uh, you know, so you can use a Bayes classifier um, from Scikit-Learn. Scikit-Learn has, you know, there should be an example of um, using Scikit-Learn Bayes classifier down here. 
uh, there's the uh, Gaussian um, naive bays in B stands for the naive bays. Um, Let me bring up the help here for this. Got in, in B. But, but you know, once you instantiate this model, you know, then you would use it the same way as the classifiers that we've been using before. So um, So yeah, there's, there's, there's an example kind of walking you through this. Again, I, I think this comes from the hands-on machine learning original, originally um, uh, textbook uh, discussion on the naive bays. Um, so in, in this case, the naive bays, uh, when you train, uh, when, you, when you fit the naive bays model, um, um, it's going to be calculating uh, some of these these prior probabilities and remembering those, um, so that uh, when you may want to make a prediction, um, uh, it doesn't have to recalculate those. So it's basically going to be um, um, kind of filling out these these likelihood tables or the equivalent um, inside of the object, um, uh, uh, so you can do predictions with it. So, um, Bayes, um, I don't know if we have the um, Um, uh, naive Bayes is not um, made for, uh, it can't really be used for um, doing regression problems with it, right? Because, you know, the, the, the probabilities, the, the things that we're working with uh, were, were uh, basically using, dis, you know, a set of discrete uh, inputs and outputs, I think. But, um, so that then implies that, that the output, you know, the, the, the result that we want to get is a classification problem. So yes, no, or, or, or whatever we're trying to predict here. Um, the probability that uh, it's going to rain if it's overcast, right? Uh, but um, this also kind of implies in this example that the all the inputs, the features have to be categorical as well, which uh, is not necessarily the case. So um, if, if you pass in non-categorical, Categorical features to uh, like the the Gaussian uh, in B. Um, I believe it basically uh, is going to um, break them up into um, uh, a set of, um, of um, you know, uh, you know basically discretize that range, right? So, it's a, um, so, so if we have something that's a real valued number, it's going to have to break it up into ranges. Um, I believe, if I remember right. So, um, um, but uh, but yes, yeah, so I'd I'd have to go back and look that up. Um, Remember that. So. Um, but some of that is, you know, not obvious just from the examples here, since everything is a categorical variable, variable both the input um, and the output that we're trying to predict here. Um, So like I said, though, but, but, but yeah, you really can't use Bayes for regression problems. Um, so, but uh, I don't know if I've mentioned this before. I mean, you can't always turn a regression problem into 
uh, a categorization problem, right? So the, the same idea. So, you know, instead of predicting the particular house price, um, I could have the categories of, you know, less than $100,000, 100,000 to 500,000. So, so um, you can't always do that. You, you don't always want to do that, you know? So sometimes it makes more sense to, to, to do a regression problem because, you know, you, you really want to try to be predicting exact house prices, right? So. Um, but um, but yeah, so if, if, you did, if you did want to use like naive Bayes, um, uh, you, uh, but you've got something that's inherently uh, real value numbers, you would first have to um, uh, make it into a categorical output um, before you can kind of proceed. Um, um, All right, so yeah, the rest of this notebook was then just using that. Uh, so some of the stuff, you know, we're kind of reviewing some things here. So for example, um, um, using some of the scikit-learn um, encoders and things to uh, encode string values into numerical values. Um, so, So yeah, that's what the basic label encoder is doing here. Um, yeah, and all, all of these were just were, were labels, but we can't really use those labels uh, directly. So those have to be turned into a categorical variable. Um, so we talked about that. So we could either use just a regular zero, one, two, or we could use like a one hot encoding Right. Um, so in this case, we're just using the simple um, um, you know, basically tra transforming it into an, uh, an integer um, based on the label here. But, but yeah, we'd, we'd absolutely have to do that for these kinds of categories, no, no matter what classifier, or what, no matter what kind of model that we're using. Right? We can't pass in string data. You know, we, we have to get those into uh, either an integer value or into multiple integer values for like one hot encoding. So, um, but otherwise, right? So um, once you've done that, you know, using the, the Gaussian uh, naive Bayes is going to fit into the same, in, in the same framework for scikit-learn. So, you know, we first have to fit the model. Um, and, and then after that, we have the, the normal stuff that um, um, you've seen before. So we can do predictions with it and um, um, create confusion matrices to see the results and, and all that kind of stuff. Too. So, you know, there's always the question um, whenever you're doing uh, a machine learning algorithm for classification, um, so some of them more easily can do multinomial classification, which is a fancy name for, you know, where the output is not a, a binary zero or one, but um, something with more than two values, right? Um, so a lot of that stuff is, uh, I think I mentioned before, is, is hidden from you. So, so you might not know using scikit-learn whether the, the um, underlying machine learning algorithm um, natively supports multinomial classifications or if it's inherently binary um, and it's doing kind of the extra work for you in order to make a multinomial classifier when you ask it for it. So, so normally scikit-learn, you know, if you give it a multinomial data, so multiple classes, um, it will just create a classifier for you, um, um, uh, whether it inherently can do multinomial or not, right? So, so we, we, we talked about that a little bit before, right? So, so things that are inherently binary, you have to usually create multiple classifiers. So, so like if I have four outputs, I have to add a classifier to discriminate between zero and one, 
another one between zero and two, another one between zero and three. Right? So you'll just have multiple of those, and then you have to combine those in some way to get your final answer. Um, So uh, anyway, um, I'm probably just gonna wrap up here. So uh, there's last example here using the Gaussian um, with multiple labels, sorry, the, the night bays with the multiple labels. Um, so yeah, and again, you know, so there's only really three classes here. Um, I can't remember exactly for the wine data set. Um, um, but, but yeah, this was kind of the quality of the wine for these three different classes here, um, which kind of a thing that you might want to predict, you know, um, you know given measurements, um, what's the quality, which could be used to set price and things like that, right? Um, So again, I mean, you know, after doing these labels, you know, we basically just have zero, one, or two for the labels. So, um, I mean, I guess you can see that um, you don't have to do anything special um, for, for the, the, the naive bay. So, so it will train it um, um, to, to make the, the multinomial prediction. Um, All right, um, let's see, anything else to say about naive bays? But I know I kind of um, skipped over that a bit. I mean, I, I've um, been in and naive bays, I mean, naive bays is usually considered um, a, a better performer, kind of middle of the pack uh, in terms of how well it would normally do. It's really better than came in. Uh, but it's still, um, uh, you know, it's, it's not, um, um, it's not going to be competitive with some of the, the better known ones like support vector machines or decision trees, um, uh, kind of the modern things, or, or you know, uh, you know, with the deep learning or something like that. Um, um, yeah, it's usually fine for, for uh, medium ish data sets. Um, and, and make a good kind of baseline to compare um, other uh, more complex methods later on. All right. Um, oops. So, right, does anybody have any kind of questions? about uh, things where we're at right now to bring up. Anybody online, if you want to ask anything, type it in. If not, um, we're probably all I was going to cover today. Um, so I'll probably go ahead and wrap up the session here. Like I said, I'll get the, try and get the test back to you here um, soon, hopefully by tomorrow or something. Um, I probably should have mentioned, uh, so our next assignment, I'm not sure if it's, it's posted yet. Uh, let's just check the assignment, um, see if I need to get that posted too. Um, let's see. So yeah, looking ahead. So we're working on the KNR neighbors and the night bays, and then we'll cover support vector machines and decision trees and ensembles. Um, and then later on, we're going to get into unsupervised learning, the dimension probably reduction, and that's, that's quite a bit different. So that, that's um, so you know that, that's a big 
um, split, you know, supervised learning versus unsupervised learning method, right? So we'll spend a few weeks talking about some of those things. Um, but um, But yeah, our next assignment, um, I probably, probably haven't posted it yet, uh, but, but our next assignment is going to be over support vector machines, um, basically. Um, so I'll talk about that next week, I guess, uh, since I haven't even posted it yet. Is it, is it showing up or something? Um, Right. Yeah, set here. Um, yeah, that date is a little bit too far out. So um, we're definitely going to start on the assignment for next week. So it'll probably be due on, um, uh, the, oh, well, I guess it's about right. So, uh, well, um, it'll probably be due more like the 12th. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's a little bit too far out. So, um, it's back. Well, yeah. So I think that, yeah. Or not as well. I, I've been doing Sunday for you guys. So the 14th or something like that. So. All right. All right. So, yeah, if people miss that, so there's a question about the date on that. So um, the date probably hasn't really been set yet, but uh, we'll still have another week or two, um, two weeks probably um, on, on the assignment for once I get it posted here. So. Yeah, so both of those will be moved down. So basically, probably the 12th and then two weeks after that will be a fifth assignment. Um, and then we'll see about stuff after that. It might might just be test two. I'm not certain if we'll do more than five assignments here. So, okay. All right, so that's it. I'm going to go ahead and end the session. Send email questions if you have. Uh, and I'll see you guys later then.